far more than just meddling. The allegation, a dozen Russian military officers waging cyber war to alter the course of an American election. How will the president react when he meets face to face with Putin? Here at home, conservative Brett Kavanaugh nominated to serve on the nation's highest court. Will his confirmation spark open combat over abortion rights and gay marriage? In the Lone Star State, midsummer poll numbers place Democrats in striking range of Republican rivals. Could Texas actually turn less red come November? And beneath the rotunda in Austin, word that lawmakers will soon have more tax money to work with. How should the additional billions be invested or should it be spent at all? I'm Greg Grugan and welcome to Watch Your Point where our panelists call it like they see it. So let's greet them. Starting us off, Republican strategist Jessica Colon. In the two spot, Bob Price, associate editor of Breitbart, Texas. Next up, Republican state senator Paul Betancourt. <laughs> Next up, <laughs> businessman, columnist, and former Kima Mayor Bill King, and closing us out on the hot corner, Chicano activist and educator Tony Diaz. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> As the President of the United States stood beside the Queen of England, Justice Department officials 3,600 miles away announced the criminal indictment of a dozen Russian military operatives in connection with the hacking of the Democratic National Committee. The detailed charges of cyber espionage aimed at impacting the outcome of the presidential election come in advance of Mr. Trump's summit with Russian leader Vladimir Putin. Putin has told Mr. Trump there was no meddling. America's best investigators say they have proof that's a lie. The conspirators created fictitious online personas and they used those personas to release information, including thousands of stolen emails and other documents. Okay, panel, what do you think of these indictments? I'm going to start with Jessica Colon. Well, if we go back to what this is about, as if the Trump campaign colluded with Russians to do this, that is not what these indictments are about. These indictments are about them breaking, the Russian spies breaking into the DNC and the Hillary Clinton campaign. So that's one thing. We're still arguing the point and saying that it's a witch hunt if the Trump campaign had any colluding with Russians, and that is not what these indictments are about. It opens up a bigger thing, and, and I you know, just heard on the news on the way over here, which is a valid, a completely valid point. We're spending all the time, time looking at the, what the Russians have done to break in and to meddle with our elections. What about the rest of the world? I'm quite certain that our other adversaries are trying to meddle in our elections too, and we should start looking at that and not just simply focusing on the Russians meddling in our elections. But if the Trump campaign colluded with Russians to do this, that is not proven. We're still in a witch hunt scenario, and we need to wrap up this investigation. Bob Price, I've heard this called hybrid war, a, a war for the new millennium. Was it an act of war, and what should the president say to Putin tomorrow? We've certainly had seen the cyber warfare against the United States on many, many occasions. The United States has done the same in some other places in the past, uh, particularly when you look at the Israeli elections uh, with the Obama administration's interference in that election. So. Uh, we don't have clean hands in this issue, but we do need to take action on it and protect our electoral process. Once again, this in, these indictments show that we didn't need a special prosecutor in the first place. The only thing that the millions and millions of dollars we've spent on the special prosecutor have gotten us are indictments against people that could have been done through the regular Justice Department, foreign nationals, they're the only people that have been indicted for interfering in the election, and then we've had some other process crimes that have come on from there. So. As far as the meeting in Helsinki, the president needs to be firm on this issue, and they need to let him know that that's not going to happen. We need to find some ways to do it. If Germany would quit spending billions of dollars on natural gas from Russia and spend that with the United States, that would do a lot to hurt Russia and help the United States and help the alliance. Tony, uh, I'm guessing that you're thinking that Trump uh, will soft pedal this tomorrow. Well, I'm really confused why President Trump is scared of Putin because that's what it really appears like. So if you're in NATO, he'll yell at you, Melania in front of your people, 
uh, and change the story once he thinks he's gotten what he wants. But if you're our enemy, sworn enemy, uh, that sabotaged uh, now evidently our elections, he soft pedals it. So to me, it's odd that he does seem scared. So we need to support President Trump so he doesn't feel scared <laughs> against Putin because he's got a big mouth against, you know, British people. He's got a big mouth against Canadians. Evidently, he thinks the Canadians are more of a serious threat, so maybe he's going to build a wall along the northern border as well, possibly. But it is mind-boggling that, of course, all these years of World War II, NATO, where all these alliances have helped fight back fascism, all of a sudden, he's ignoring all that. And here's the worst part. There is hard proof that Russians tampered cross the border into our elections and here he is not confronting the person responsible for that I, i'm shocked that our president is scared of putin and tough on little kids at the border okay coming to bill and paul in just a second the russian indictments come during a week when critics contend the president ran roughshod over nato allies with particular punishment delivered to prime minister uh british prime minister theresa may and german chancellor angela merkel Mr. Trump trashed May's handling of Brexit and suggested Germany was owned by the Russians because of long-term dependence on fossil fuels from the NATO rival. Is the president intentionally wrecking our relationships or are his very publicly delivered criticisms justified going to Paul Bettencourt? Look, here's the bottom line with all of this. The entire NATO contingent should be yelling at Putin because every single one of their elections has been quote, cross the border and violated by the Russians, okay? Now look, the Russians have been after all these, uh, you know, these elections, and in the U.S., the difference was, was the DNC guys had great passwords like passwords, and at least the RNC had passwords they could hack into. That's the only reason why they got in the DNC servers. So the bottom line is that we're looking at what's happened for the last several years. It's going to keep happening until people stand up, and that's what he's doing. That's what Trump is doing. He's trying to to stand up and, and recognize the obvious, and I think it's going to be a pretty fascinating conversation with Putin this week. Bill King, what's your read? Well, I think everyone needs to remember that the, the special counsel's charge was once to determine if there was foreign influence, and then secondly, if there were any U.S. persons that cooperated or conspired with it. So, look, I think the first part of that charge is very important, and he appears to be doing that, and I'm glad to have the information out there and have a better understanding of exactly what they did. So far, no evidence has been brought forward that a U.S. person conspired. Whether that happens in the future is yet to be seen. But, look, Trump is right. NATO does need to pay more. You know, he's right. They ought to be buying natural gas from us instead of the Russians. I think he's got every right to complain about that. But I agree with Tony in that I wish he was as hard on Putin as he is on our allies. I mean, every time he gets with him, it's just sort of buddy-buddy stuff. And look, I, I'm not one of those that thinks we not shouldn't talk to our adversaries. I think you talk to everybody in the world. But I just wish he would use some of the same tough rhetoric on Putin that he uses on our allies. Bob Price, is there another shoe to drop here or, or, or not? Well, in terms of NATO, I, I served in NATO during the Cold War. And since the Cold War ended, the Europeans, for the most part, have taken the peace dividend and quit paying their fair share on the issue. Germany pays 1.2%, and they're the strongest economy in Europe. They pay 1.2% of their GDP into it. They're required to pay and agreed to pay at least 2% and should be paying more than that because the primary purpose of NATO was to keep Russia out of Germany. And so that is where we need to go with that. The president is doing the right thing. You have to be tough on your allies because they will take advantage of you and Look, to have taken advantage of us for, for generations. It, it's, on this. it's not just being tough on them. Let's just state the obvious again. Look, it's not just 2%. It's what's in the 2%. Well, the Greeks are spending close to 2%, but most of it's social welfare. Look, NATO has got to be retasked. They've got to realize what their mission is, and they've got to come up with a number that everybody agrees to pay. Otherwise, we're going to pay more because that's just the way the, the structure of the alliance well, is set up. And, and them getting the peace dividend is, a, is an economic advantage Ooh, for them and absolutely. disadvantage. To us. Well, so let me jump in here. The we should take note there. that yeah. there were huge crowds, particularly in the United Kingdom, protesting Trump. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you were heartened by that, Tony. Well, uh, I got to really commend Britain on their piñata game because they've taken the Trump piñata and made it this huge balloon that has made international news. And of course, Trump insulted the 
uh, multicultural president, I'm sorry, um, mayor of London, who then gave protesters permission to fly this huge dirigible-like piñata. That's one thing. Secondly, I want to remind folks, World War I, World War II, very expensive, and to put off World War III, NATO's been very handy in that. So I think we should all remain friends, and we need them. Real quick, Jessica. Art of the deal, Trump said, no, NATO, you should do 4%, just to make sure everybody does, does do their 2%. And with these protests, with the paid protesters that are going on around the world, these protesters are having less effect on the issues that they want, and they're showing that they really don't represent the majority opinion. Going to leave it right there. When we return, a new conservative for the nation's highest court, who is Judge Brett Kavanaugh, and can Democrats torpedo his confirmation? Stay with us. Welcome back. With Democrats preparing for a confirmation showdown, President Trump selected 53-year-old conservative jurist Brett Kavanaugh as his second appointment to the United States Supreme Court. If confirmed, Kavanaugh will replace longtime swing vote Anthony Kennedy and almost certainly push the high court to the right. A graduate of Yale Law School and 12-year veteran of the federal bench, Kavanaugh has argued presidents should not be distracted by criminal investigations or even questions from a special prosecutor. My judicial philosophy is straightforward. A judge must be independent and must interpret the law, not make the law. Hey, Paul Bettencourt, you like this guy? This pick is already out of the park, okay? <laughs> The White House says that the Senate's holding together. I know that Susan Collins and Lisa Murawski are now in favor of Kavanaugh, so this is over. In fact, uh, McConnell is saying that he'll have uh, Kavanaugh confirmed by October 1st, which is when the start of the Supreme Court term is. Now look, and why is it? He's got 300 opinions. He's the most documented uh, justice appointee ever. He's as solid as the Rock of Gibraltar. And the bottom line is the only thing that the Democrats are doing now is saying, oh, he's got terrible expenses, and the expenses are for baseball tickets. I'm not making it up. That's the only thing you can say about this guy that's bad. He's a, he's a, a grand slam home run, and it's already scored a bunch of points uh, for what the Supreme Court's going to look like in the future. Nianza, you're a progressive attorney, a progressive American. Does this guy worry you? Yes. I mean, this has become a situation where the president is picking whoever will rule in his favor mm. when there is a criminal charge against him, if he's ever indicted. He's basically picking his jurors. So that should be <laughs> illegal. At the end of the day, when did it become okay to say, if the president is, is he's too busy for a criminal investigation, well, what about if he murders somebody <laughs> while he's the president? Should we go ahead and say, well, he killed this lady over here or shot somebody in the middle of Fifth Avenue, but we're not going to do anything about that because he's too distracted. When does the buck stop? And I'm not, I'm not sure if, if you understand, but the Supreme Court, we're not supposed to know their opinions. Every time they hear a case, it's supposed to be first come, first serve. The first, they base it on the facts of the case at the time. That's how they set the law. They're not supposed to let you know preemptively how they would rule. Jessica, what's well, the grassroots saying? Well, grassroots, grass. lo the grassroots <laughs> loves this pick. Everything's coming up roses in the grassroots with this pick, let me tell you. Um, but when you're a judge, you write opinions, and that is where these opinions are coming from. After you get the facts. Uh, after when you you're a facts. judge, you write opinions. The bottom After line here the is yeah. that yeah. this is going to be this is going to be one of the most um, easy confirmation hearings that we've seen. The Democrats are going to put up every fight, and they've already suggested that Kavanaugh should recuse himself if there's ever something that comes forward from Trump. Well, then every president, that is their job, is to nominate jurists to the Supreme Court. That would mean that Sotomayor and, and these other jurists would have to recuse themselves if something came up with Obama. It's the most ridiculous argument we've ever heard. Kavanaugh's solid. He's a great guy. And furthermore, he has focused on ways to give Congress more power, to let legislative authority rule as opposed to executive authority, and he has been pretty silent on social issues. So this is one that Democrats should have zero problem with. We're already hearing the marketing campaign that this choice, whatever choice, uh, will lead to a challenge of Roe, mm -hmm. will lead to a challenge of, uh, of gay marriage. Uh, should the Democrats go all out and fight this fight, even if they know they're going to lose? Well, I think right now we need Democrats with spines. They're going to stand up for the community, workers, civil rights, all the legislation that have been fought so hard for. And on top of it, I'm going to quote Trump, the system's rigged. He said he was going to pick, he was going after Roe versus Wade. He had put a big target on it. Right now he's coming in to fulfill it. It sounds like a big racket. It's heartbreaking to hear that this blind justice system, like every minority in America ever thought, is rigged. 
because the president just said, we, I can get legislation and laws to swing the way I want, and that's what he's been gunning for. Roe versus Wade is going to be attacked. If it doesn't work <coughs> the first time, there'll be six, seven, eight attempts at it, and then it'll come back to the states. So this November, we've got to make sure we win so that we have a voice at the state level to keep things fair. Close this out, Bob. 55-45 is my prediction. 55-44 is my prediction on the, on the vote on this. Mm -hmm. I, I think he'll win easily. Right. Uh, the judge has expressed in the past that his respect for settled law, for, for a precedent in cases. Uh, I don't think he's going in there with a mission to overturn anything. If a legitimate case comes forward and it presents itself, you know, we have overturned settled law in the, fa in the past. Look at Dred Scott, a very good decision to get overturned. So um, I think he will do a good job for the, for the president on this. The other thing, though, is you never know what a justice is going to do once they get on the court. You know, David Souter was appointed by a Republican president, but he's been anything worst, but. Worst pick ever. <laughs> <laughs> worst pick ever. So you never know what somebody's going to do. Okay, I need, I need to let Bill, Bill King in here real quick. Uh, look, the guy's clearly competent and qualified to be a, a Supreme Court justice. You may not like his politics, but that's what elections are about. Elections have consequences. If you don't like this, his politics, then win an election. And Trump won the election, and he's picking the Supreme Court judge. Russia, Obama Russia helped. Russia, Russia helped Obama them. Obama it's it's over. Putin, Putin did it. Obama's We're going to break. <laughs> <laughs> New poll numbers rattle the Texas political landscape. We'll discuss whether Democrats are actually in striking distance of Republican rivals. Stick around. Welcome back. While there are still 113 days to go before Texans again cast ballots for candidates running statewide, some fresh poll numbers have attracted some midsummer attention. A voter survey published by conservative news outlet Breitbart has both Governor Greg Abbott and Senator Ted Cruz leading their races by 10 and 9 percent, respectively. Down ballot, the races tighten significantly with Democrat Mike Collier trailing Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick by two points and Republican Attorney uh, General Ken Paxton up by four over Justin Nelson. What are we to make of this, Senator Paul Betancourt? Okay, this is just the dog days of the summer polling, okay? People do it, they make money <laughs> at it, and the real poll obviously doesn't get started till after Labor Day and, of course, with the election in November. Now, here's the real deal in this election. Beto and Ted will be the top of the ticket. They'll be competitive race, Cruz will win. The congressional races could get very close. In fact, there could be an upset or two. But then you want run into where the blue wave, if it exists, runs into the Abbott firewall of just $60 million. And Lupe Valdez is the worst Democrat candidate for governor in 100 years, and she's going to prove it because Abbott's going to win by close to 20 points. And when that happens, the downhill you know, a slide doesn't occur, and everybody downhill from there wins. That's just the way the numbers work. Tony Diaz, the, the numbers work that way? It's, it's great to hear the Republicans nervous because this book, I, 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 I love to hear all the smack talk about a 20-point win. This poll, which Breitbart published, put Beto within nine points of Ted Cruz, Rafael Cruz, right? Within, within nine points, if there's a four point plus or minus that's within five points which another poll had Beto come in with the five points we have a real game going on right there and here's the other part that I love about this poll it didn't ask all the Texas first questions Texas first do you want a firewall in Spring Branch okay do you want a big wall in Spring Branch no we want to make money in Texas so guess what even the same poll said less than half of the people in Texas are not being conned by this tax scam that Trump pulled. They're not making money off it. I want to find out where people feel on the tariffs. Because guess what? If you're making money now, you're going to lose money because of the tariffs. So what I love to see is that you put Texas first, you don't vote Republican. He's filibuster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a filibuster. I'm going to my unapologetic moderate. For, for, <laughs> what's going on? Oh, gosh. So um, I, I agree with Paul. I think Valdez is an extremely weak candidate. And for that to be that, to be the second place on the ticket, I think really hurts the Democrats' chances. Uh, I'm a little surprised at the Cruz or Rourke numbers because I've been doing a lot of traveling in neighborhoods studying this flooding issue. And I got to tell you, I see. Beto signs every place, and I have not seen a single cruise sign so far. 
Now, signs don't, obviously, it's not scientific, but I'm just saying that race feels a lot closer than nine points. Okay, we've got to leave it right there. I'll come back to you. You better. <laughs> Up next, <laughs> he's the former Navy SEAL looking to succeed Ted Poe in Congressional District 2. But first, he'll have to convince voters his brand of leadership is exactly what they're looking for. Republican Dan Crenshaw returns to our hot seat after the break. Welcome back. After serving and suffering for our country, Lieutenant Commander Dan Crenshaw returned home with the heartfelt conviction that he still has much more to give. This spring, he emerged victorious from a crowded field of talented Republican rivals as the conservative choice to replace retiring Congressman Ted Poe. Now he's squaring off against Democrat Todd Litton in what promises to be a very clear-cut political confrontation. Dan Crenshaw, welcome back to the hot seat. Thanks, Greg. It's great to be here. All right. You've defended this country. You know what war looks and feels like. Friday, 12 Russian military officers charged with attempting to alter the outcome of an American election. Was this cyber espionage or an act of warfare? And how should the president respond? Uh, it's certainly a national security threat. Uh, calling it an act of war might be a bridge too far. That has implications that, uh, that might cause us to overreact. Um, but it's certainly a national security threat, and it's absolutely something we can't ignore. I think there's bipartisan feeling for that. Uh, the president has to be forceful with, um, with, with, with how he answers on this. He's got a meeting this week in Helsinki with President Putin. Um, this needs to be addressed. It, it needs to be addressed in, uh, in Trump fashion, <laughs> you know, where we, where we actually see him uh, confronting Putin about this. Uh, this and, and many other issues. Um, there's, there's a whole plethora of issues on the table with respect to Russia. Um, they're not our friend. They're, they are, they're not necessarily an enemy, as the president says, but certainly not our friend. They're certainly a competitor and possibly an adversary. Uh, they do not have America's interest in mind when they act. They deserve some retribution for this, whether that's us increasing our own uh, the, the cyber defense capabilities, um, talking about what we have on the table as far as um, uh, offensive capabilities. But, of course, um, those discussions need to be had, and there needs to be some... Um, reckoning here with President Putin. Okay, Dan Crenshaw, border security and immigration, both big issues in this race, in this district. Do you support the president's zero tolerance policy, including the separation of family members caught ent entering our country illegally? Yeah. Uh, well, unfortunately, this terminology of zero tolerance has, has, has become conflated with family separation. Absolutely don't support family separation. Never have. I've always said I have not. Um, the unfortunate reality is that zero tolerance simply means enforcing the law. And the other reality is that the family separation policy is part of that law. It, it stems from a 1997 um, court ruling which required uh, immigration officials to actually separate families. That's unfortunate. It needs to be fixed immediately with legislation. Uh, the president has fixed this but it has to be fixed permanently with legislation. We absolutely don't want to see families separated at the border, but we also have to enforce our laws. This kind of makes the case for border security even stronger because it, it goes to show, it's something we've always known all along, when you have hundreds of thousands of people already on our side of the border, it creates a situation that is completely unmanageable. It doesn't matter how many immigration judges you put down there, it doesn't matter how many perfect laws we craft, you can't deal with hundreds of thousands of people crossing the border. We need border security as part of the solution. So you have to have humane uh, laws but that, that, that respect our, our nation and respect our country's uh, uh, ideals of law and order. So if elected, you go to Congress, you're going to be working for comprehensive immigration reform to try to fix the system? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And Republicans are trying to do that. All right, now we're, we're getting hit from all sides as we do it, but listen, you need border security, you need comprehensive immigration reform that, that I think prioritizes legal immigration. We need legal immigrants in Texas. There's, there's no denying that. Uh, I do not want to lower quotas for legal immigrants, but we have to stop illegal immigration. That's physical disincentives and economic disincentives, you know, whether that's mandatory e-verify or, or uh, and, and, and moving to a more merit-based system. Dan Crenshaw, the president has recently weaponized, so to speak, American trade policy, launched billions of dollars of tariffs on friend and foe alike. Do you support Mr. Trump's strategy, even if it has a negative impact short term on Texas trade? Well, free trade is, is good for Texas. So any end goal I have in mind needs to be free trade oriented. Um, 
So you know, tariffs are not necessarily the best way to go about some of these. Now, if you're talking about China in particular, that might be a different story. I'm going to have a little bit more sympathy for a hard line on China. I'd rather see a little bit more targeted sanctions on, 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 on certain uh, state-owned industries within China that are, that are uh, you know, acting poorly on the, on the, on the global trade um, war. Um, but when it comes to our allies in Europe and Canada, uh, you know, I'm much less supportive of tariffs. And, uh, it, and the reality is, is it hurts us here in Texas. But I think we all need to come together with our allies and, and, and look towards China and, and, and hold them accountable. So when, when the president uses um, national security as a justification for, for tariffs on, on Mexico and, and Canada, you don't, you don't think that's, that's valid? No, I'm not supportive of that. No, I'm not. All right. President Trump has nominated Judge Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. What do you think of the choice? Uh, is it your hope also that uh, he'll revisit or the court will revisit controversial issues like Roe v. Wade and, and potentially even uh, gay marriage? Well, listen, it's a great choice. And it's a great choice, and I'm, and I'm speaking to my friends across the aisle when I say this. It's, it's a, choosing a judge for the Supreme Court is not about choosing a judge who will, who will pursue liberal or conservative policy agendas. That's not what judges are there to do. They are there to interpret the law according to the Constitution. When the Republicans choose judges, that is the criteria in which we choose them. So whatever choice comes up, whatever, whatever ruling is made, it should be in accordance with that. We choose judges to, to, to rule from the Constitution, not make legislation from the bench. So it's a great choice. Do you think that it's improper of Democrats to suggest and try to fight this choice by raising the issue of Roe v. Wade and gay marriage and the prospect that this court moving to the right will try to readdress them and, protect, uh, and potentially overturn them? It, no, it, that, that's not a good reason to oppose a judge because a judge doesn't go up there, let, let's, let's pretend that they actually overturned Roe v. Wade right now. What would happen? It wouldn't make abortion illegal. It would simply put it back to the voters. Now that, I, I think that's what Democrats maybe don't fully understand, is that this, isn't a, this is not about making law from the Supreme Court. It is about interpreting law according to the Constitution. So it doesn't matter whether you're pro-life or pro-choice. Overturning a decision simply means it goes back to the voters and law is made according to where law is supposed to be made, which is the legislatures. All right, Dan Crenshaw, we'll be following the District 2 race very closely. Thanks for uh, joining me in yeah, the hot seat. Thank you so much. All right. Great to be here. Okay, when we come back, more cash in the coffers of the Lone Star State. With billions more tax dollars to spend, how should Texas lawmakers invest your money? Our team offers suggestions when we return. Welcome back. When Texas lawmakers return to Austin in January, they will have an additional $2.8 billion at their disposal. State Controller Glenn Hager says thanks to increased revenue from sales tax and energy production, he's raising his estimate. So with a very key lawmaker in our midst, what should be done with the additional cash? Should we spend it or save it or maybe some of both? I'm going to start with Nyanza. Well, I think that we, here's the thing, we didn't get enough. <laughs> I said that last week that we need more than 2.5 million. We need more. We need to spend more. And then we need to make sure that we spend it on things that are right. Now, I know that you're all about the money. So I'm going to go ahead and defer to you so I can have a response back to whatever you say. This week, CNBC named Texas for the fourth time in 12 years the best state to do business. And it's because of our uh, major uptick in energy uh, this, that we're seeing here, uh, the upswing in, in Texas. So I give it to Paul. That's why Hager said that we have a 2.5 have billion dollar increase in revenue estimates. Okay, I'm going to go Bill King. Uh, should we save it? <laughs> it? <laughs> well, uh, one thing we definitely need to spend it on is a third reservoir. Yeah. Uh, yep. right. I know that's something that Paul agrees with me about. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that when these, when the revenue is up, they also go up for the local entities. So the city of Houston is up almost 30 million dollars in sales tax or what they projected, but it hasn't stopped them from charging us from parking in Memorial Park and for ambulance fees. <laughs> ambulance. So maybe we ought to take some of that money and cut out all the nickel and dime. Real quickly, Tony, because I'm going over here next. Even Hagar said, though, that we got to be careful with these tariffs or else we won't be making all this money. And we're not going to send this money to pay for no stupid wall. Mm. Okay, Price? Well, 
let's bring the Texas money where it needs to be spent. I agree completely on, on doing the third reservoir. We've got to stop the flooding that costs us billions of dollars in repairs. Let's invest some money in infrastructure that would, guess what? You build another reservoir, you've got another lake, you've got all the additional tax revenue that's going to be created by that. It's a win-win for everybody. No one more influential on the Senate <laughs> Finance Committee. Paul, what's your read? Okay, the read is we've got about $110 million to spend, which is up by over $2 billion. However, we're already in the hole about 5 to $6 billion from the last session. So even Hager said that this is just going to help pay it off, and we still have Harvey to pay off, and Bill's right because the city wants to bring back the drainage tax. And more importantly, we're going to have to scrub down the budget because we're, we're going to go into the rainy day fund for sure to pay some non-operating expenses for the first time. But this is all good because the economy is roaring again. And by the way, the new state bird of the state of Texas is the construction crane, because whatever town <laughs> I turn into, you are so right. it oh is God. there, mm -hmm. and we're booming, and we should be happy about it. <laughs> okay, let's stay happy. Up next, a secretive center for juvenile immigrants in Harris County admits multiple escapes, and neighbors are angry. Plus, a local school district for troubled and disabled kids draws fire from parents alleging chronic abuse. Stay with us. Welcome back. As progressive outrage boils over the Trump administration's detention and separation of foreign nationals entering the United States illegally, we here at Fox 26 News have taken a closer look at a secretive facility in Harris County where thousands of juvenile immigration offenders have been housed over the past eight years at a current rate of 238 taxpayer dollars per youth per day. Angry neighbors in the Lynchburg neighborhoods say they have watched as teenage Central American de detainees simply scale the fences and disappear into America. Government contractor BCFS concedes to seven unauthorized departures in the past three years, but folks who live next door to the converted elementary school say they've seen far more cut and run. I see them climbing over the fences at nighttime. Uh, they came in my yard many a times. Uh, I've seen them hiding. Bob Price, your thoughts. First off, great reporting on this, Greg. It was a good, good job on this, and I had the pleasure of putting it on the bright bar to give it a little bit more attention than it deserves. Thanks, sir. So, um, $238 per child per day. That's your tax dollars at work. Now, these aren't security detention facilities. These are, are shelters for these children, which means that they are not allowed to detain them. So for them to just walk out, one of them, I think you said, r rode out on a riding lawnmower or a tractor. <laughs> you know, uh, the climb in the fences, <laughs> they're threatening really the neighborhoods. And, <clears throat> and these, these groups have become basically scam artists that are rake, raping the American taxpayers. There's an organization that runs 26 of these throughout Texas and Arizona that where the, the CEO of the organization, a nonprofit organization, is making a million and a half dollar a year salary. That's your tax dollars. That's ridiculous. So we need to solve the problem. When you want to look at abuse of these children, however, you need to look at what happens to them before they cross the U.S. border as they're being smuggled through Mexico. Tony, you're aware of this facility. Does it play an important role? Is it necessary? I mean, there's, that's a lot of money going. Well, and it's part of our immigration, bro our broken immigration system because folks need to remember, these are basically the unaccompanied minors that we heard about long ago. So this is a lot different than what's happening with the families being separated. The big difference would be that, imagine a 17-year-old, because they're underage. So a 17-year-old, you're going to tell them, okay, you don't speak English, you don't speak Spanish, stay in this room indefinitely. In theory, they're supposed to be linked up with their family members who are here somewhere in the U.S. or not. So it's a very complicated system for one. And secondly, these aren't like the little two-year-olds. So right now, by separating families, we have little two-year-olds who go in a courtroom and they're supposed to defend themselves. These are big kids. And it's like, hey, guess what? I'm not staying in this room. I don't know why you want me here. So, and it's us citizens that are caught in the middle. So we are caught in the middle because you got working class families that see these kids behind, you know, their fences and get scared. Our tax money is going to this. It's not getting fixed. And you got families that are separated. We got to put our heads together to fix this the right way. There's some crazy elements about this in that, you know, some of these kids are released to families who 
are undocumented and, and or, or they they jump the fences and, and emerge mm -hmm. or, or just disappear into into the population and I, I answer, and but that was their initial goal when they came to the country was to jump the fence emerge and then just mm -hmm. meander their way into the population undetected so what we're seeing is exactly what the goal was so er, all of those children are going to try to do the same thing escape into america and hide forever and so that's and so when they do that and then they become um, working class people that end up paying tax dollars and then 20 years down the line the same 17 year old is now 37 and somebody's saying oh you need to be deported because you got here illegally well in that case nobody's gonna say oh we empathize with you we're gonna say well you jumped a fence instead of waiting your your turn in the line so it's kind of a sticky situation but at the same time this is our broken immigration system just like Tony said it needs to be fixed Anybody have anything else? I would add one more thing to this. These are not just children that are in these things. Many of these are violent criminals, members of MS-13, members of other gangs. You're seeing a lot of violence that you reported inside the, this organization. And nationally, when you look at the percentage of unaccompanied alien children that become or were MS-13 members when we get here, that's a major problem. They're crossing But those the are border. stereotypes. It, They're little stereotypes. I mean, in the, six, it, in the six know, years, know, in the know, six know, years, know, years know, those were facts. Okay, real quickly. In the like six that. years that they've had the, the facility, six people escaped, and there's as much crime as anywhere else. Yes, let's make sure there are not gang members there, but that's not the case. That doesn't apply to all of them. Tony, okay, you got it wrong. It was seven people that seven. escaped. Seven. Sorry. Six. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> We're not there for now. There is another little-known local institution drawing fire. If you've never heard of the Harris County Department of Education, you've got plenty of company. Critics call the obscure public school system a, quote, dumping ground where local districts can send disabled and mentally disturbed children they don't want to deal with at a price of 22,000 tax dollars per year. The Texas Education Agency has recently launched an investigation after staff at the ABS West Campus was caught on camera brutalizing an autistic student. A whistleblowing former teacher told Fox 26 the HCDE campuses routinely rely on physical force rather than therapeutic intervention and generate little, if any, academic progress for students facing deep challenges. It is a dumping ground. Um, there is not instruction, academic instruction going on. It is kids being warehoused in a room with staff waiting by in case one of them acts out so staff can jump on them. What? Paul Bettencourt, I think you have something to say. The Harris County Department of Education should be ashamed of themselves. Your reporting was fantastic because it, it showed what was really going on. And the sad part of it is that it's now the light of day on an organization that needs oversight that has none because the way this is structured, this is the only county education department left in the state of Texas. It should be abolished. I think we're going to go have an election on it. I hope that's the, the legislation I'm going to file. But it's just so sad to see the, what they're doing to autistic kids. And here's what really makes me mad. I've had these bills before, and these people have testified that they're the professionals. They know what they're doing. They have to stay in, you know, stay in, in, in government. The fact of the matter was that was a disgrace of how they're treating those kids. And this is an organization that if they can't tell the truth up in Austin and they can't take care of kids in, in down here in Houston, why do we have them in Harris County? I'm, I'm, I'm broiling mad about this, and it was a fantastic report. Bill King, every year on my taxes, there's a line that says hmm. Harris County Department of Education. Hmm. So I'm paying for this. We are all paying for this. Your thoughts? Yeah, one of the, one of the public policy challenges we have in this region is this proliferation of governmental entities. Now, the last time I checked, I think we've got a thousand governmental hmm. entities. Uh, and by the way, this is an organization that collects $80 million a year in tax money. Uh, Paul's absolutely right. This is one we need to get rid of. ASAP. Jess, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, this has just been a battle that we've been fighting for a long time to get rid of this uh, entity. And we have elected people who have said they're going to go in there and abolish it, and then they don't do it. So I support uh, Senator Betancourt's uh, legislation to abolish HCDE, and we need, to, we need to get this show on the road and fix this. No. So, but when you think about education, when you think about these children, what's going to happen to the children when you abolish it? Where are we going to send them to? Do we have a safe place for them to go to where they can actually be helped instead of hurt? Where they can't, if you're autistic, then you're already starting off with a, a need that's special. So you would think that the adults in the room would do something to protect the children. But if we 
eliminate the, Depart the Harris County Department of Education, we need to then have a better place for the children to be cared for and monitored where the people that are in charge of them are monitored as well. We've, we've cracked down, Nianza, on, we've actually now insisted that you can have cameras inside of school districts on special needs classrooms because of problems like this. Uh, there were some horrific cases that came out of San Antonio that Greg reported on where kids were actually handcuffed, I believe, at one point. Now look, you know, and, and where will these kids go? They'll go back to the school district that they started from because right. really what's happening is they're being subbed out and at a high expense and we need to get that uh, back to the school district where there's accountability. See, here's the big problem I've got with ACDE. There's no accountability and actually a bill that I had that would actually let us audit ACDE also didn't pass. Now, that was because the House wouldn't support it, but I think after this report, they're going to support it because it's the right thing to it's do. It's another reason not to give teachers guns to <laughs> right. Okay, still right. ahead. Our panel answers that key question. What did we miss? So stay with us. Welcome back. These days, critical events are unfolding in fast and furious fashion. Capturing everything you need to know is tough duty, and that's why each week we endeavor to fill in the gaps by asking our panel, what did we miss? Tony Diaz. Hey, Jorge Ramos, the journalist who Trump threw out of his press conference, has a book out now, a great line, where he talks about the Eli Wiesel line, which says, no human being is illegal. Bill King. Part of the city's proposal to increase ambulance fees is a $350 fee if you are so inconsiderate as to die before the ambulance gets there. But what I'm wondering, with all the ambulances breaking down, if the ambulance breaks down and you die because of that, do you still owe the $350? Good question. Paul Bettgard. Okay, the city is also, Mayor Turner specifically, is floating the balloon and bringing back the drainage tax. This time, even more than what you're paying on your bill now, four times as much, 400 million bucks a year, and it's another wasteful expense. We're going to keep an eye on it. Bob Price. Good to see Tony promoting fake news. I, I don't see you protesting the separation of a family in, in California where an 11 time deported illegal alien attacked his wife with a chainsaw and separated her from her three mm. children. Yikes. Nyanza. Uh, on a lighter note, Alpha <laughs> celebrated 68th Boulay and closed out the banquet on Wednesday night with record setting Guinness Book World record breaking. So we set the record in 2008 with the largest plated dinner. Now we set it again, but also we left this city $30 million richer. So thank you, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. We made it. To yes, Jessica here Lowe. we are. Um, I just, it, the world was captured by the rescue of the Thai soccer team and their coach from this cave, an amazing heroic display of bravery and tenacity. And don't miss Chris Wallace's interview with Vladimir Putin tomorrow. Wow, okay, that's all the time we have. Thanks to our team. 